Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. As we do get started today, uh, we're continuing our Jack Webb Centennial Celebration, and I do want to let you know that we do have our Joe Friday Never Said Just the Facts Ma'am t-shirt available on sale at friday.greatdetectives.net. You can get a uh, a regular t-shirt, a lady slim fit tee, or you can also try pullover hoodies. We've also got a wide variety of different colors, and you can order at friday.greatdetectives.net. Well, now we turn to Pete Kelly's Blues. Uh, Pete Kelly's Blues is an interesting uh, series uh, as it began over radio, but eventually became a motion picture and uh, then a television program uh, in the later part of the 1950s. And this was definitely a labor of love for Jack Webb. Dragnet was really something that he began, you know, out of necessity because he was, you know, out of work uh, with uh, Pat Novak for hire going on summer break, uh, and he needed some way to make it through the summer. Uh, by 1951, when this aired, Dragnet was a big success over radio, and there was, you know, movement already to bringing Dragnet to television. So he didn't really, you know, need to do this from a financial perspective. But this was really his passion project, as he followed the adventures of Pete Kelly uh, back during the uh, era of Prohibition, the 1920s, using his great knowledge of jazz, uh, Webb actually, you know, as we mentioned on The Amazing World of Radio, he uh, did host a program uh, in San Francisco of a jazz uh, program. So he was this huge expert and aficionado in the world of jazz, and he took that knowledge and applied it to creating Pete Kelly's Blues. We're going to go ahead and listen to an episode uh, of uh, Pete Kelly's Blues uh, from that uh, 1951 summer run, and then we'll have a special bonus after the program you'll definitely want to hear. But let's go ahead and take a listen to uh, this episode of Pete Kelly's Blues from August the 22nd of 1951. And the title is Gus Trudeau. This one's about Pete Kelly. This one's about him. <laughs> about the world he goes around in. It's about the big music and the big trouble and the big roar of the 20s. So when they ask you, you turn right around and speak up. You tell them this one's about the blues. Pete Kelly's blues. <laughs> Pete Kelly's Blues, starring Jack Webb, with story by Jim Moser, music by Dick Cathcart. Number 417 Cherry Street is a standard speakeasy. The help is paid in cash, and the books are burned at the end of the month. Every week, we use 30 cases of booze and a pound of coffee. After salaries, there's gas and lights and a payoff to the Prohibition boys. In Kansas City, the price is good. For a hundred bucks, they steer in the drunks and make one rate a year. The place is run by George Lupo. He's a quiet little guy who wouldn't give you the sweat off an ice pitcher. The beer's green and the gin's as young as yesterday and the music's loud. I'm Pete Kelly. I play cornet. We start every night about 10 o'clock, and we play till they sweep out the broken glass. 
We don't draw any customers. We don't chase any away. The music is straight New Orleans. It started in the front parlors of Storyville and drifted north. Some of it laid over in Chicago. That's where I got on and rode it out here with a piano player named Rosie. He's still with the band, but last night he was barely with it. We took a break about 11. Rosie was late getting back. He might as well have stayed in there because he kept looking around the room and the way the piano sounded, you'd think he had on a catcher's mitt. All right, let's take five, huh? Sorry, Pete, I'm a little behind tonight. You haven't left the station. What's the matter? I'm nervous. Take a look around. Near the door, back this way. Place is full of cotton. Oh, forget it. Have Jake open a couple of windows. And take a walk. Get yourself in shape. Not till I find out which way to fall. These boys are here for heavy duty. I learned that out in the kitchen. All right, let's duck behind the stand. Come on. All right, what about it? You know Dutch Courtney? I drink his beer, that's all. Somebody shot Courtney up tonight out near Highway 40. Well, that's too bad. He'd have drawn a good crowd downtown. Who killed him? I don't know, but whoever he is, he's in for a big night. And the police are trying for him, so is his partner. Well, let him play. How does our place fit into it? I couldn't guess. We'll soon find out. See the big guy who just walked in the door? Yeah. Boss cop? Almost. It's Eddie Newman, Dutch Courtney's partner. Yeah. Come on, we better get back in the stand. <laughs> I'll hear you later. Come on. You hear about Dutch Courtney? They picked him out of the mud tonight. It means nothing to me. It does to me. Dutch was a friend. Well, if it'll help, cry. I'm short on time, Kelly. Give me a rundown on Gus Trudeau. There's nothing to say. He played for a while and he went to the boneyard. You know him. You know his sister. You'll have to ask Courtney about that. I haven't seen her since the old days. You know Gus well enough to figure he didn't like Dutch Courtney. He didn't like him one pound. Well, you can't blame him. Dutch sidestepped and paid Trudeau's way to jail. Bookkeeping. I don't know anything about it. All right, look, Newman, you're on the wrong track. Now, this is a job killing. Your boy got frisky and somebody sent down a Chicago gun. The price tag shows. Sorry, Trudeau's my pick. What did he hit him with? A high-powered rifle? Gus Trudeau's away up in Leavenworth. He used to be. Gus went over the wall this morning. When he shows up, I want him. Well, why pick me? I ask around. He'll head for you. He's broke. You'll need train fare. No, not if he killed Dutch Courtney. Somebody will give him a railroad. When they dragged the blues out of the back room and moved them up front, there were three of the best leading the parade. They were all blowing cornets. One was Buddy Bolden, one was King Oliver, and the other was Gus Trudeau. There was a lot of music, but not much man picked me up on a union date on the south side of Chicago and taught me how to play. He got into me for a Boston three-star cornet and gin for the rest of his life. When he got down to running errands for Dutch Courtney, I left for Kansas City. A couple of months later, Courtney needed a patsy and Trudeau was it. He wound up with a five-year stand at Leavenworth. But Gus never felt right unless he was in trouble. Only this time he cut me in for a piece, too. Well, I picked up a drink at the bar and fought my way back to the stand. Anything wrong? No. Did you finish the set? One more to go. Sensation. All right, let's do it. What's wrong, Pete? A friend of ours killed Dutch Courtney. All right, sensation. One, two. <laughs>
get off for a while, huh? Who'd you say killed Dutch Carton? Gus Trudeau. And what, Prayer? Trudeau's in jail. No, not since this morning. Uh, which one of you is Kelly? I am. A friend of yours in town wants to see you right away. Who is he? He's waiting up at your room. Did he give a name? Just Gus. An hour later, I was still looking for an out. The muscle man on the side door went to the bar a little after 2 a.m., our base man, Red, loaned me his keys, and I slipped out. I got on to 12th Street, picked up his Erskine coupe, and headed up for my room. All the way out Grand Avenue, the streetlights were spending the rest of New Year's alone. Some guys with wide brooms were pushing at the confetti, and the fog was loafing down in Washington Square. When I got to my place, I parked the car in back and headed up the stairs. The college kids down at the end of the hall had their door open. The party sounded young. I was looking for Gus when I opened the door, but he had a substitute. I knew her way back at 18th and Hall Street. She was pretty and the fastest freight in town. That must have been a long time ago, but it was somewhere along the line she'd run into a batch of Wednesday weekends and she wasn't pretty anymore. Hello, Pete. Where's your brother? I don't know where Gus is. That's why I'm here. I knew you'd be the first one he'd come to. Yeah. Now what about the break? I was up to see him two weeks ago. He didn't say anything about it. Pete, we got to help him. I've been hearing that since I met him. You're the only one who remembers, Pete. You're the only one who cares. No, a lot of people care now. Eddie Newman wants him. The cops are looking hard. I got to find him before they do. You got to help, Pete. He was supposed to meet me. That's all I know. I'll wait for him. He needs a hand, Pete. He's in deep. Yeah, well, he's always in deep. Now, you do what you want, Madge. I ran front for Gus too long. I'm out of the habit now. Please. If Gus wants cover. He can look for a police station. Gus can get away. Some money and a car. That's all he needs. Going to take more than that to get out. Every cop in town's working tonight. Give him a chance, Pete. Help him. No, no, thanks. Gus has been good to you, Pete. He taught you music. He's been nothing but good to you. I'm paid up. I bought his gin for him for five years. Well, then do it for me. What I used to be worth. Now, Madge, it's old. That was 80 years ago. I can't help, Gus. Do it for me. I haven't changed that much. I have. You're still the same. You've been working at it. You remember. Yeah. Oh, it's the same, Petey. It's just like the first time. You never had a first time. How about a drink? Will you help me, Pete? Find Gus. Get him out of town. Ten bucks. It's as far as I go. Ten bucks and a quarter. Now I'm getting off. Where are you going? Back to work. Tell Gus to take care of himself. Hold it right there, Pete. You stayed too long in Chicago, Madge. I bought the gun in Kansas City. Don't go for the door. You better give it to Gus. He may need it. We're going to find him. You're going to help me. All right, come on. Give me the gun, Madge. If I shoot, it'll hurt. Put it away, Madge. Come on, drop it. Ah. Who is she? Little trade. Who are you? Cage. I worked downtown homicide. We got on the floor. Madge Trudeau. Tell me about her. I knew her in Chicago. After that, I heard she did favors for Dutch Courtney. After that, I don't know. She tired? What's she doing there? Looking for Gus Trudeau. Oh. Where is Gus? I don't know. I've been asked that twice tonight. Now, this is the third time around. I don't know. You probably will. Why? Why do I have to get into this? Because you're Gus Trudeau's friend. Well, then let him get another one. I'm tired of the job. I don't blame you, fella. You're going to come out of this with a lot of trouble. For instance? I'll make it simple. If Gus Trudeau shows and you hide him, we'll book you for Aiden and Abetic. Yeah. If he shows and you turn him over to Newman, we'll send you up as accessory to murder. Yeah. If he shows you turn him over to us, Newman will probably kill you. Well, that's good. In the meantime, what do you guys do for a living? We're busy. We couldn't prove Newman killed you. It's after two. Get back that club. And leave you here? I got work to do. Like what? This woman. See if I can get anything out of her. Yeah, it's been done before, but I'll bet ten to one in your case. <laughs> Go on back. I'll tidy up here. All right. Good night, cop. Leave the rugs. <laughs> I left Cade standing in the middle of the room looking down at Madge Trudeau. He didn't watch me leave, but I figured it wouldn't be too long before he turned that gleam back on me. I went back to 417 and I ran into our piano man Rosie outside in the alley using a smoke for a chaser. Happy holidays, Petey. How's Gus? I didn't see him. 
An odd hour of the morning, Petey, but I figure the fates are hard at work shaping up a few sordid futures. Cut the piano, huh? You've got a very limited selection. What do you mean? Before the general citizenry sits down to breakfast, you may get a reward. The eternal kind. Come on, what is it? I've got it all figured for the two of us, Petey. Today we'll spend our time dodging destinies. We'll hit for some small back room. I'll bring the bottled goods. We'll live on gin and sauerkraut and make the walls sit up and listen. One horn, one piano. The blues, Petey. We'll ride them into the middle of next year. All right, throw the bottle away. Will you just set me straight, huh? Across the river, there's two places, the High Life Club or Fat Annie's. You sure he's there? That's what the word is. I'll pass the hat down at the Union Hall for both of them. Discuss alone over there. Right now, but there's going to be a crowd. What do you mean? I told you. Yeah. When Eddie Newman gets back, i got to tell him. Well, I knew it was a silly move. Newman had a hundred guns on tour for Gus. Cage and the boys from headquarters were standing by for seconds. Helping Gus Trudeau was out of order, but I couldn't get one thing out of my mind. If Gus did kill Courtney, why didn't he pick up some travel money before he did it? It was backwards. If you're going to hang up your pants, you take them off first. Well, it was about 3 a.m. when I got down to the river and crossed over to the Kansas side. The High Life Club was smoked up and had a little of everything except Gus Trudeau. I looked in the kitchen and tried a back room. And then I went to the bar to see if I could drum up some talk. I had one taker, a boy with wavy black hair. He got up from a table of three others, walked over and sat down next to me. Huh? All right. Come in here, Alvin? Well, that's the first time. Welcome, man. I'll buy you a drink? Well, I'm all set. You try one yourself. Huh? Right. I think drinking's all right, but I hate people to drink too much. Don't you? You work here? Well, not regular. Sometimes I dance when the other act doesn't show up. You here alone or you waiting for something? I'm waiting. For a guy named Gus Trudeau. You want his friends? I'm it. Where is he? Well, he left a while ago. I'm not sure where he went. Well, you get sure. It's important. Well, you're asking someone named Bessie. All right, hold it. What are you here, Kelly? Get away, Newman. Try another stool. This will do. Well, if he asked you to leave, I think you should leave. Oh, well, a car boy, that's nice. Leave him alone. Who is he? I never saw him before. What does he know about Trudeau? Nothing. Now, don't kid me. You're not here to spend the time of day. You're here for Trudeau. You little friend. Where's Gus Trudeau? I don't have to talk to you. I'm a guest in this place. You're not anymore. Climb down and head for that door, both of you. No, you can't make us do that. We're not going to leave. It's a split boat, Buster. I don't like the way he pushes. That's right. Just walk. I bet you look good. I knew right then, as we walked across the floor, I knew Eddie Newman wasn't going to leave him alone. He was going to pick at him, whether he knew anything about Gus Trudeau or not. It was going to get messy, and the boy with the nice eyes was going to help. Outside, it wasn't snowing anymore, but the ground was covered right down to the river. There was a moon out, and it looked all right, if you like nature. We walked over toward a bunch of trees. Newman's car was parked there. It was a black touring sedan with a strong-arm guy in the back seat. There's another one sitting on the running board. He had a machine gun across his lap. This will do. All right, now, let's hear about Gus Trudeau. I don't know anything about him. This man and I were just talking. Go easy, Newman. I never saw him before. Did you always talk to strangers or bet he does? It's none of your business. Where's Gus Trudeau? I, I wouldn't tell you. Suppose I knew. I wouldn't tell you. Yes, you would. Yes. You, you keep your hands off of me. Stop pressing, Newman. You don't care about Trudeau now. You just don't like this guy. Stay out, Kelly. Come here. You... Let go. Let go. Stop screeching. I'll you... break your arm. You keep your hands off me. You... you pig. You dirty pig. You're in trouble, fella. Shut up. Well, he is a pig. His hands are all dirty and his teeth are dirty. I bet even his clothes are dirty. All of them. Now, lay there. All right, Dave. Move in here. Back away, Kelly. You're up, choir boy. No, no. Please, mister, do something. Don't let a thing like this happen. It already has, Buster. No, you can't. Tell me, Newman, did you ever find out about Gus Trudeau? Newman didn't answer. He climbed into the car and they drove off. Well, I stayed there for a minute to look at the guy in the snow. His face was unmarked. I did him a favor. I rolled him over so it showed in the moonlight. I knew his mother'd want him to look real good the night Eddie Newman's chopper squad cut him down. 
Well, it was getting cold out, and the name Bessie had to mean Fat Annie's place up the river on the Kansas side. I made it there and found Bessie. She was back at the piano, wandering around somewhere in the middle of the blues. You couldn't miss that voice if she took up yodeling. Bessie Smith. I've got those Kansas City blues Since my man has gone away Hi, Pete. Bessie, what do you know? Run back, Pete. You go up the stairs, the loft, way up there at the top. All right, thanks, Bessie. All right. Felt my way out and around back and up a couple of flights of stairs that didn't creak in time with the music. There was a door at the top and I pushed it open. He was hunched back on a pile of hay in the corner. He sat up and blinked a couple of times. There wasn't much left, just the frame. And rattling around inside, a lot of tired echoes that wouldn't lay down and die. There was an empty gin bottle on the floor. Petey, I knew you'd get here. Yeah, well, I didn't make it easy. You're looking good, Petey. Everything six to an even, huh? You forget easy, Gus. You're in the jam. You broke jail. Yeah, I told him all about you up there, Petey. I told him there's another Gus Tudor blowing down to Kansas City. I'm proud of you, Petey. Yeah, sure, Gus. You're just like me, Pete. I told him all about you. You're the only good thing I ever done. I knew you'd come through. A car and some money, Pete, it'll do everything. It'll make it all new. Is it too much to ask? You tell me, Pete. They want you for Dutch Courtney. You know better, Pete. I didn't kill Dutch. You had a reason. Yeah? Forget. He hung a frame on you, Gus. Five years worth, remember? I didn't kill Dutch. Get me a drink, huh, boy? No, not tonight. Don't preach at me. Just something to help me over. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Now, come out of the fog, Gus. You're going to get a drink or a train ticket from me. You take your pick, because it's the last time around. Just listen to that. Bessie's still going strong, ain't she? Yeah, and so are the cops. I got one idea for you, Gus. Get moving. You remember Chicago, Petey? You and Madge? Chicago always liked me. You checked out, Gus. Biterbeck's got your chair. They'll remember me and you, Petey. I found you when you were nothing. What are you going to do? Where are you going? I got it all set up. It's big and brand new. A place in Mexico. Yeah? The guy who bunked in my cell with me, his mother runs a place down there. Be just like it used to be. Yeah, well, you won't get there on a gin bottle. I got it set up, boy. Car and some money, it's not much to ask. You haven't got a drink, have you? You can drink in Mexico. Where are you dreaming up the car in the dough? It's fixed, boy. You just see this guy and tell him I'm ready. Abe Gaffney. He's got a place on Pershing Road. You know it? Yeah, I know it. Abe's doing all this? Just tell him I'm ready. All right. How's Madge, please? She's all right. Come and see me, huh, Pete? It's hot in Mexico. It gets hot here. What's the matter, Pete? You ain't sore, are you? No, I ain't sore. I'm just tired. I'll tell Gaffney that I'm checking out. Goodbye, Gus. You're not getting too big for your old friends, are you, boy? Friends are like everything else, Gus. Yeah? They wear out on you. It wasn't any different than a dozen times before. I knew there wasn't very much left, but I wasn't looking for a second-rate ghost with an empty gin bottle. I crossed the river back to the Missouri side and headed down Main Street and then swung over toward Abe Gaffney's place on Pershing Road. It was pushing close to 5.30 a.m. The sun wasn't up yet and the night was too tired to care. I pulled up in front of the Murad sign in front of Gaffney. Inside, a counterman with pimples and coffee was leaning on last night's paper. A beaded curtain shut off the hallway that led back to Gaffney's room. You want some? Yeah, Gaffney. Not here. Where do I find him? I don't know. I was supposed to meet him here. That's so? Look, this is Gaffney's place. Where is he? I told you. Now listen, Junior. Maybe you think you do a good imitation of Calvin Coolidge, but I want an answer. Where's Gaffney? What's your name? Kelly. You could have saved an argument. This way. Through here. When do you go to bed, Kelly? You still looking, Newman? I'm still asking. Where's Gus? I don't think you'd give me time to answer. There's a good reason why I let you walk away tonight. 
I gave you two hours all by yourself on the cancer side. I don't think you threw him away. You got a line on Gus Trudeau. I want it. I got nothing for you. But don't be silly, Pete. The cops get him where I do. He goes either way. You get no help from me. I don't want no help. I want Gus. Now, come on. Come on. Come on. I'll make you part of the wallpaper. You better send for Dave. I don't need him. I think you do. And I don't bother to get up. I'm leaving. I don't believe it. Wasn't your turn, Kelly. When I got up off the floor, the room was cold and the lights were out. Newman was gone, but I knew he was still in business. I knew if he didn't find Gus Trudeau this trip, he'd come back for me. I got into Red's car and followed the radiator cap back to 417. I found Rosie back at the stand having breakfast. Did you bring an egg, Petey? I hate to drink on an empty stomach. Newman been back here? I haven't noticed. You look abused. Yeah. Anybody say anything? You were missed. You heard the news. What's that? They found the guy who got Dutch Courtney, a fellow by the name of Doyle, East St. Louis. Cops got the goods on him, gun, fingerprints, the works. Yeah. Well, it's been a long night. What was his beef with Dutch? Doyle owned East St. Louis. Dutch wouldn't believe it. Leave it to Gus. If there's a hole, he'll fall in it. Makes it easier on him now, doesn't it? Newman will call his boys off now? Well, somebody better tell him in a hurry. Did you see Gus? Yeah, I saw him. He's trying to get out of town. Pete Kelly? Yeah, that's right. Abe Gaffney, Pete. Well, you're a hard man to find. Newman came in the front door. I went out the back. This won't take long. Car keys. Money for Gus. No, you got the wrong guy, Abe. I quit an hour ago. Fight it out with yourself. The car's out in the alley. It's a great chance. I tell Gus it needs gas. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You can take this stuff to Gus. You know where he is. No, thanks. You take care of Gus. He's an old friend. What's the matter with you? I hardly knew him. The clock over the bar was leaning on 6.15 We got back on the stand and started the last set Eighty pounds of stale cigarette smoke was holding up the ceiling And waving down in a dirty blue curtain over the dance floor Behind the bar, one of the guys was wiping up Two couples picked their way to the dance floor And pushed each other around a while We finally gave up Oh, the whole thing, it was all out of step. Wrinkled stockings, brown gardenias, torn paper hats, and Gus Trudeau. He walked in the door and stood off to one side, just back of the stand. All right, it's the last one. Blues and B-flat. Call tonight, 10 o'clock. You can pack up. Hey, Pete. Pete, over here. I heard you. You sound good, Pete. It's just what I told him up there. You're on your way, boy. All right, now you heard it, Gus. I got the money for you in the car keys. I'll see you, Gus, huh? You know what I told him? Another Gus Chudo's blowing down in Kansas City. Yeah, yeah. I only got one thing to tell you, Pete. Don't forget it. Play like you talk. Don't lie. 
Hi, Madge. Hold it there, Pete. This is a family fight. Stay out. I thought I took that gun away from you. What's the matter, Madge? What are you doing? No, don't sell me that talk, Gus. Dutch can't hear you. What do you mean, Madge? You killed him. You blew your top and you killed him, just like you did everything else for me. You and the gin and that cheap brass horn of yours. You spent us all, Pete and me, and you ran through the whole bunch till you got to Dutch. Pete, I didn't do anything. You killed Dutch Courtney. I loved him. I loved him enough to square it. Well, you got it all wrong, Madge. Goodbye, Gus. I'll tell him to throw your horn in after you. Want to read the paper, Madge? You killed the wrong brother. Stay away, Peter. It's in the paper, Madge. Guy by the name of Doyle. He killed Dutch. They're not sure, are they? Yeah, they're sure. What'll I do? I got two things for you, Madge. (laughs) And the car keys. Now you see what you can do with ten minutes start. You didn't have anything more for Gus, did you, Pete? No. No, I guess not. Well, he made it. Yeah. Gus finally got out of town. Pete Kelly's Blues. Starring Jack Webb with story by Jim Nozier and music by Dick Cathcart. Scoring by Matty Madlock. Pete Kelly's Blues is based on characters created by Richard L. Breen. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Welcome back. Well, Pete Kelly's Blues was probably Webb's most downbeat uh, radio program. Uh, But it did feature some really superb music. Plus, you hear at the end of the program that uh, the characters were created by Richard Breen, which does make sense when you hear some of the dialogue. It's not quite Pat Novak, uh, but there are some definite similarities. And it seems like a little bit more, I don't know if the best word is grown up, but it's a bit more down-to-earth take on the sort of dialogue and response because you can definitely sympathize with Pete and what he's going through here as he's dealing with someone that he does care about but this guy has really just you know constantly you know taken advantage of the friendship and made poor choices and continually you know expected Pete to uh, bail him out. So while Kelly definitely has his rough edges, I think you're going to appreciate where he's coming from. Now, as I mentioned, Pete Kelly's Blues uh, became a movie. And as part of making that movie, Webb did a publicity tour that included uh, stops in a wide variety of different places and actually included a call-in interview that he did on the Howard Miller Show. So we're going to go ahead and listen to that interview uh, from August the 8th of 1955. Wrigley Spearmint Gum presents The Howard Miller Show. And now with music on records, here is Howard Miller. Thank you very much, Ed Joyce, and good morning, everyone. This is Howard Miller from a vastly cooled-off Chicago. Finally, good old Lake Michigan breezes start cooling our town, and I hope you're just as pleasantly satisfied as we are. I know that you are if you can reach for a package of that ever-loving, that wonderful-tasting Wrigley Spearman chewing gum. Now, ordinarily, each morning at this hour, we start by playing some music for you, because actually, of course, this is a disc jockey program. But today we feel that the keen, sheer excitement of our guest star is of such tremendous national importance that we're going to forego the pleasure of playing some music because we've just been advised that the United Airlines plane, which bears the Jack Webb party in his coast-to-coast tour, has just set the wheels down on the runway at uh, the municipal airport in St. Louis, Missouri. It's been taxied up now to the American Airlines depot or concourse. The KMOX engineers, our CBS engineers in St. Louis, have quickly rushed all of our equipment aboard the Jack Webb Special. And waiting there to talk to you now is this great star of radio and television and now currently of motion pictures, a great guy, Mr. Jack Webb. Come on in and say hello, Jack. 
Good morning to you, Howard, and everybody up there in wonderful Chicago. I miss you already, and I've only been gone an hour and a half. Well, you know, you're talking to the whole nation now, Jack, because your voice is being heard in 168 cities from coast to coast, and I know that they all love you just as much as we do. Oh, thank you. Now, Jack, you um, are on a coast-to-coast -to -coast tour in promotion of uh, your current motion picture release, uh, Pete Kelly's Blues. Yes, that's right, Howard, and we're going to hit some 30 cities in 37 days. This is city number 10. Oh, so you still have about two-thirds of the trip to go. Indeed we do. Now, in the course of uh, these travels, have you figured out how many miles you will have gone, Jack? I imagine about 20,000 miles. And that's from coast to coast? That's it. Uh, Jack, what has been the reception of the picture so far? I know, of course, that publicity has been tremendous, but I know that you're an honest enough man to tell me exactly what box office is. Well, it looks good, Howard. Of course, uh, I feel a little like the Brooklyn Dodgers. You know, we're not sure until <laughs> the final, finally they give us the OK sign, but... Uh, it looks good. It looks like the, the people will accept the character that I play as, as they have accepted uh, the Joe Friday uh, character on Dragnet, which is most pleasing to me because it doesn't mean that I'm going to drop Dragnet. It just means that it'll, I'll have at least one outside picture a year that I can do, kind of like a busman's holiday. Yes. Here. Now, before we talk about the um, career and about the motion picture, Jack, I wonder if you'd be good enough to tell me a little bit about the trip from the standpoint of who was in your party. I know that very charming lady, your wife, Dorothy yes. Webb is with you. That's and, right. Uh, tell me a little bit about the plane of people that are in your party, will you? Let me take just one moment to tell you. We just saw a new experimental jet fighter leave the ground, and all the pilots and everybody aboard this United plane are looking out the window watching it. It was quite a sight. It's a very good-sized new fighter. Uh -huh. About this plane that we're on, it's especially fitted for this type of trip. In other words, it has a little office. It has, among other things, uh, radar, which is this new... Uh, all-weather eye that can see 150 miles ahead of the airplane, which really is going to mean so much, Howard, when it's installed in commercial aircraft, and it's rapidly being uh, installed at this very moment by the United people. Yes. It's going to make an awful lot of difference in those mainliners when you get aboard and you can fly around the weather instead of having to go through it. We're coming along real fast in air travel, aren't we? Oh, I tell you, it's just Jack, do you have uh, sleeping accommodations on the plane? We do. We can sleep uh, two aboard, and we have... A rather wonderful custom seating arrangement with uh, swivel chairs because this airplane uh, is only built to carry about 18 people. Yes. So it makes a great deal of difference uh, in, the, in the seating arrangement. How about the facilities for cooking? Can Dorothy whip up a little dessert for you and they, pamper her boy? They still haven't got that, but one thing they do have uh, are two wonderful stewardesses. Uh, Mary O'Connor, uh -huh. who you know is the flyingest woman of all. Yes. She's had many, many thousands of hours and is the has the most longevity of any stewardess in United. She's been with them, and I suppose that takes in the other airlines, too. Yes. She really is a well, now, fine woman. what portion of the plane of the fuselage are you in now, Jack? I'm right over these two enormous engines, uh, just about what, what is known as the center of gravity or the CG on the airplane, just about smack in the center. Just about amidships. A little ahead of the wing, but practically... In the center of the ship. Yes. All right, now let's uh, confine our remarks, at least for a couple of minutes, to this motion picture. You know, when the picture was first in uh, the process of being made, Jack, I heard a lot of comment from people saying, well, we think of Jack Webb as a detective. We don't think of him as a jazz specialist or a music specialist. And I've gone about almost as a crusader on your behalf for no reason other than I know that it's a mistaken opinion that actually you are much more of the music critic and the jazz connoisseur and entrepreneur than you are a detective in real life. <laughs> so there should be more believability in this role, don't you agree? Well, perhaps so, except that it's uh, such a departure for me, you know, having been associated with uh, the Dragnet uh, show for some six and a half years now on radio, and we're going into our fourth year on television, and it's asking an awful lot of the public uh, when you become so associated with a, with a given character to accept you in something else. Yes, of course. And it was a real experiment perilous for us, Howard, and uh, it was with a great deal of trepidation that we went out on this tour. Uh -huh. But I wanted to see personally uh, how the audiences, and especially the youngsters, reacted to it, and it, it's been favorable. I'm very happy to report. Yes. Now, uh, ordinarily... Uh... Your movie or your Dragnet production lasts how long to make one show? Well, when we first started, it used to take us four days and sometimes five days. And we cut it down to three, and now we've got it to where we can turn one out in about 16 to 18 hours. In other words, we work an eight-hour day, and a lot of them we make in two days, and some go a little bit longer. Yes, and of course, that uh, represents a great amount of preparation prior to the time that the shooting schedule starts. Oh, yes, Howard, and an awful lot of work uh, yes. after the production. Now, how closed. about Pete, uh, Pete Kelly's Blues? How long did it take you to whip that into shape for exhibitor's release? Well, actually, from the time we started thinking about it, it was about nine months 
pretty close to a year when you figure that we had done a great deal of planning in the early stages. But uh, the actual shooting of, of the film took about five weeks, oh. and not counting a week of what we call pre-production before we opened formal production in uh, Lafitte, Louisiana, when yes. we did our prologue. So you know, actually, for all intents and purposes, call it six weeks. Yes, there are so many things that I admire about your artistry, but I think that if I had to pinpoint the one, it's the fact that you're such a tremendous perfectionist, where ordinarily Hollywood and movie producers would... Of fake and simulate scenes, you feel that the necessity of being true to your word or the code of the ethics uh, requires that you probably spend more money than most people in making a picture. And I think that prologue that you do is a typical example. Will you tell me what that consisted of? Well, it just consisted of uh, some very, very wonderful singers from a church down there, the Israelite Spiritualist Church. These uh, people had never appeared in a motion picture, had never done anything professionally. They're about 40 strong. They sing, and we got together a little group uh, headed by a man down there by the name of Freddie Coleman, a little Dixieland group, and we staged an old-time funeral or burial for a jazz musician. Yes. And it might be interesting. I think the folks would like to know the cost because we had to take a company down there and color film and everything else. It ran about pretty close to $100,000. In other words, you shot it right there in Louisiana, which was supposed to be the scene of the thing, and that's why you did it there. That is right. Now, why do you feel that that is important? Is it important from the standpoint of the mass level, or is it important from your sense of challenge and accomplishment? I think it's important as part of the entertainment of the film, uh, or the entertainment quantity uh, in the film, because uh, it's necessary that that you, if you're going to do a picture that has anything to do with jazz, that you have a little touch of, of New Orleans, where it all began. Yes. And we just hope we did justice to those beautiful oak trees with the Spanish moss and that wonderful Mississippi River and some of the spirituals and music that were played in that scene. Well, I'm sure you, you d certainly did. Jack, I'm going to ask a special favor. I didn't tell you that we were going to do this when I saw you in Chicago last weekend, but I know that um, our gals all over the country, the housewives who help us by, of course, their purchases of Wrigley Sperm and Chewing Gum and who listen to our show every day, probably would like to meet the young lady who is married to the famous performer, Mr. Jack Webb. I wonder if after we play the phonograph record, Dorothy could put the earphones on and we could um, ask her a couple of questions like, how does it feel to cook for a detective? I'm Can we do that? I'm going to have a stick experiment and give her the earphones. All right, wonderful. And then we're going to play the Ray Heindorf version of your theme music from uh, your great motion picture, which is now being shown coast to coast. And I want to add my personal recommendation on the fact that you see it. It's a great show. We saw it over the weekend. I think you'll find nothing more exciting in movie fair any place in the country. So here's the Ray Heindorf arrangement of the Jack Webb theme music from Pete Kelly's Blues, the title tune. <laughs>
That's Ray Heindorf and his wonderful Columbia album, which, of course, is based on all the music from the Jack Webb picture, Pete Kelly Blues. You know, one of the things, gals, that I wish you'd do, and you gentlemen who might be driving the automobiles are at home right now, perhaps on your vacation, is to develop that wonderful habit, a delightfully refreshing habit of being able to reach into the glove compartment of your car, into the kitchen table drawer, wherever it is that you reach for the products that you like the best, and try... Wrigley Spearman Chewing Gum. Once you do, I know that you'll have to agree with me that it's the most refreshing thing in all the world for you to enjoy. So you reach for Wrigley Spearman whenever you feel just a little bit tense or keyed up. See what tremendous excitement you can have when you refresh yourself with Wrigley Spearman Chewing Gum. I know that you like it. Everyone does. Well, now, sitting down on the airplane in St. Louis, Missouri, waiting to talk to you as a housewife, is a housewife, Mrs. Jack Webb. Dorothy? Yes. I suppose your husband, not unlike every other husband, has a lot of bad habits. What would you say is uh, famous Mr. Jack Webb's worst habit? Well, his worst, I think, is working too hard. You never get a chance to see him, I suppose. Well, I've, uh, I have a remedy for that. I go to the studio where he is, so <laughs> that way we get to see each other now and then. That's a good idea. Uh, Dorothy, I know that you maintain your home out in California. What sort of a place is it? Ranch house or old gothic or whatever you gals talk about? No, it's sort of a... a Modern ranch. Mm-hmm. It's not very big. Just enough for two people. Yes. Is your husband there right now? Yes, he is. All right, if you'll slip the earphones on, I'd like to say thanks and goodbye to him, and thank you, Dorothy. It's a nice talking to you. Thank you. Hi, Howard. All right, Jack, our time is all up. I want to take the opportunity of thanking you, wishing you a boy voyage and a wonderful trip, and good luck on Pete Kelly's Blues. Thank you, and thank you for all your kindness, Howard. All right, we'll see you in a re- very few weeks. My best to all of you there in Chicago. Thank you very much, Jack. This is Howard Miller from Chicago. We're a little bit late, folks. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye, and you have a wonderful time today. You've just heard the Howard Miller Show with music on records brought to you from Chicago by Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. This is the CBS Radio Network. Welcome back. Well, a really interesting interview just to kind of hear Webb, you know, just talking normally, you know, about the uh, airplane and even just those, you know, more mundane details. This was right before Dragnet stopped airing on radio and became television only. And I think the interview gives you a clue to at least some of the reasoning that Webb had, you know, because Webb wanted to make one uh, movie a year and, uh, you know, doing the radio show year round, I think was something that, you know, he could not, you know, make a movie as well each year. And given the declining audience for radio, you know, it made sense to end the radio show from that perspective of his career. You know, as to Pete Kelly's Blues, the movie, I actually really enjoy it. And I do think that when viewing uh, Pete Kelly's Blues, there tends to be, you know, two schools of thoughts on it. One is the, I cannot get out of my head that this is the guy who played Joe Friday, and this is Joe Friday, and Jack Webb is Joe Friday, and there can be no other possible role that Jack Webb can play where Jack Webb is not playing Joe Friday. And the only role Jack Webb can ever play, in my mind, is Joe Friday, and if I see him in any other thing, he is Joe Friday. That's one school. The other school is that this is a really underrated film, and that tends to be where my thinking uh, goes. The music in this is great. Uh, The cinematography and the feel of the 1920s, I think they do a great job establishing that. And there are some really uh, good performances. Uh, Peggy Lee got uh, nominated for a Best Supporting Actress role, uh, for playing a woman who's abused by the villain of the film, who's played by Evan O'Brien, who's maybe a bit over the top, but I think in a good way. Uh, and I do like Webb in this uh, role. Uh, I think, you know, he's, you know, people ha- mentally typecast him, but he does do a pretty good job throughout the film as Pete Kelly. Uh, there are a couple things that I, I think you know, do in, in the production go against it. One is that, uh, there are a couple of different ways narration is recorded. Uh, one, you know, is kind of the more typical, uh, Pete Kelly narration, which is, uh, you know, more sardonic. 
It's slower. There are a couple of bits of narration that sounds more like Joe Friday. And I tend to think that these were things that were not initially intended, but ended up being added in post, and that that was a, an unfortunate accident. And the romance doesn't really work for me. But I still think this is uh, a an underrated gem of a noir uh, classic. So uh, it's, it's definitely well worth uh, seeing. Can't offer an opinion on Pete Kelly, the television program. Uh, the TV program didn't actually star Webb. It starred William Reynolds, and unfortunately, it is completely lost. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this look at Pete Kelly's Blues, the radio program, as well as this little bonus interview and my commentary. I do want to go ahead and thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Christine. Christine has been one of our Patreon supporters since November 2018, currently supporting us at the Shamus level of $4 or more per month. And that will do it for now. Join us back here tomorrow for another episode of Dragnet. And then next Friday, we'll be back to yours truly, Johnny Dollar. If you do have a comment, send it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.